Hey, we're here. It feels like just a weekly thing now. It's episode number two of Hot Sheet by Baseball America. Scotty Braun with JJ Cooper every week and all of the Baseball America crew joining us on a weekly basis. So Jeff Pond starting off the show with us today. Jeff, how you doing? Pretty good, Scott. How you doing, man? Glad to be here. I'm doing well. great. Wow. Yeah. I, actually, to, to be real with you, I've had better days because of the injury epidemic that has suddenly come to center stage in our sport. So we'll get to that. Let's hit first move because we have a big interview coming up on the show as well. So let's do this first. Meep, meep. Oh, we got the goods now. I knew JJ would like that. Let's get right uh, to Sedan Raffaella. You like it, right? Or were you a Looney Tunes guy? I, I was. I'm old enough to definitely uh, remember Looney Tunes Saturday, you know, Saturday mornings, but also it's fitting for Sedan Raffaella as well because I kind of in my mind can envision him kind of taking off. He's got some speed. He does. Well, give me the breakdown of the eight years, $50 million that he just signed to an extension. Do you think it was the right move for the Red Sox? And what do you project for Rafaela, who's already a big leaguer, of course? I, it, 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 we got to see a little bit this week already, kind of the value of this, why the Red Sox would be interested in doing this, in addition to why Rafaela would be interested in doing this. Because there aren't many guys who can give you plus defense and center and are very legit shortstops as well. Rafaela, ideally for them, is their center fielder of the future probably. But at the same time, when you have an injury like they had this week with Trevor Story, he's a very plausible, very realistic option at shortstop. I think it's going to be him, maybe some, and David Hamilton. But it's something where there aren't many guys out there, Jeff, to me, that can do the, the shortstop center field back and forth combo. Obviously, they had Kike Hernandez who could do it uh, out, you know, at, at some point as well, but there aren't many guys who can do that. And it's funny you bring up the, the Kike example as well, because I think that's something that I think it was Ian Candle uh, of Sox Prospects who tweeted it out when the injury happened with Story that, hey, like Rafaela is a really plausible option there. And I think any of us, you know, I'm here in New England, I've seen Rafaela since he was back in. Uh, short season A when they used to have that level in Lowell. Um, he was a guy that wasn't a superstar on that team, but I think the scouts and other folks who were in attendance, he stuck out for the bats of ball skills, just high level uh, uh, baseball aptitude. He's a guy that will take the extra base. As, a, as an infielder, he was incredibly smart, got the most out of his tools. And then they moved into the outfield. And I think for my money, and we were saying this last year, it's him, Pete Crow Armstrong, Victor Scott, in terms of the elite center fielders. And I would argue that he's probably more polished and a little bit less flashy than those other two guys where he's kind of just going to make the play and, and not to say he won't dive out and lay out and, and cover the ground, but he's not necessarily the glove flip kind of guy, that sort of thing. But I also think offensively, he takes some time to adjust. It happened last year in double A when it was up in Portland. It's obviously cold up here in new England still. Um, but he's a guy that takes a little time to adjust to the level. He's an aggressive swinger. He's a guy that likes to swing at pitches out of the zone. But he has bat-to-ball skills. He has speed. He has some bat speed and the ability to hit the ball to his full side in the air. Um, so I think he's somebody that, in the totality, the values in the defense, the values in the versatility. But as an offensive player, he's going to hit a little bit. He's going to get on base. He's going to hit for some power. And when he is on base, he's a guy that can steal 30, 40 bags in a season. And the Red Sox just lost Trevor Story for the season. It's been a devastating signing for them because of the big injuries that he's had. So, JJ, you mentioned the versatility. I mean, do you think Rafaela ends up spending some more time now on the infield than he anticipated? Yeah, I think because of this, I think you have to. And the thing that does jump out with that is, is at this time last year, as bad as it is for Boston, at this time last year, they had less plausible options than they do this year. David Hamilton is kind of uh, uh, a speed and defense guy even more so than Rafael. I think the, the hitting ability is not at, at Rafaela's level, but those are both guys who are plausible shortstops. Where I felt like coming into the season last year with Story kind of coming off the injury, they really didn't have a, a, a plausible option at the time. So it is a little bit of, I, I would say it's not great, but it's better this year than it was at this time last year. We're going to swing it to the top farm system in the game, according to Baseball America, as we have our first prospect guest. We will have many throughout the season here on Hot Sheet. We are excited to be joined by Cade Povich of the Norfolk Tides, and he is a top 10 prospect in the system. Cade, great to have you on. Thanks for the time. How much freaking fun is it to be on a team full of 
big leaguers that should probably be up in the big leagues already. Yeah, man. I mean, thanks for having me on first off, but uh, it's it's been unbelievable to watch. And I mean, we've been on the road, so them being able to hit and going out to a lead both times I started is definitely kind of puts your mind at ease a little bit. Yeah. Kate, okay, the thing that jumps out with that is, is it's got to feel good as a pitcher. I, I think that your, your lineup is averaging 11 runs per game right now as a pitcher. When you take the mound and you know, okay, I'll probably get nine, 10, 11, 26 runs, depending on the day. It's got to be a great feeling when you head out there for the uh, first inning to know, okay, they're probably going to have my back. Man, it's it, it puts your mind so at ease. Like I can just I can go out and pitch because I know no matter what's going to happen, we're, our bats are going to probably be hot and we're going to score some runs, and uh, I can just do what I need to do. Cade, who's yeah. your favorite hitting prospect on the team right now? I. Right now, every single one of them. <laughs> <laughs> give, give me a scouting report. Like, uh, let's start here. Give me a name that needs to be talked about more. So, obviously, you know, we're not going to allow you to, to say Jackson Holiday, but g- give me someone else in that lineup card that needs to be shouted out to the national audience. Yeah, I mean, one of the guys that's probably the hottest. And, I mean, he's been talked about a little bit, but Stowie, is, it's been unbelievable to see how hot he was in spring training. Um, and how he's carried that over into the start of this season. Uh, I mean, it, I, it seemed like I was thinking he was going to hit a home run every single game in Charlotte. Okay, to talk about with your career so far, you've kind of had a, a very interesting you know, path since Nebraska. You were a twin originally, then you kind of get to hear that, that call, hey, you're heading to a new organization, you're heading to the Orioles, you're heading to you know, one of the, the most stacked organizations uh, you know, in – in, in baseball, what is that like as a as a prospect? What is it like when you kind of have to interstel- introduce yourself to a whole new a whole new team, kind of get get adjusted to a new organization? What what was that like for you? It was definitely interesting. Just also being a little bit for me. Um, I know coming up on the deadline, it really wasn't anything I expected or wasn't hearing anything about. Obviously, it didn't pay too much attention to it and. When it happened, it was kind of a surprise, uh, especially just being first year um, with the Twins. Uh, but then coming over to a farm system like the Orioles, um, being the number one farm system in baseball the past few years, um, obviously means a lot. Um, means somebody thinks pretty highly. And, um, you know, you're on teams that have guys that are going to be more than likely future big leaguers. and. I mean, there's so many people in this organization that um, are close, close to being up there. Um, and it, it, it helps out a lot when you have the kind of talent um, on the field at, at the bat. Um, and then also, uh, obviously, I feel like a little underrated on the pitching side. But I mean, we have some great arms as well. Jeff, go for it. Yeah, and I you know, got the opportunity to see a pitch. Uh, as you started and pitched a few innings in the spring breakout game. Um, what was that opportunity like to be able to do that and start the season in AAA and to sort of be obviously very much in the thick of the Orioles' plans going forward? Uh, the, the breakout game was super cool, um, kind of bringing the, the top prospects um, from our from us and then also from the Pirates and, and kind of being spring training. I know halfway through I had to remind myself, like, hey, this is still a spring training game. Like, just the kind of way the atmosphere felt and everything, it, it felt like a real game. Um, I mean, it was when I got the call that I was going to be starting that game. It was, it was definitely special and a real honor. Um, and I was thankful to, to join all the guys like like Jackson, like Mayo, like Norby, um, and then throw against like Skeens. Um, so so it's it's been super cool, super cool spring training, um, super cool to be a part of this team in AAA as well. Can you mention it? Like, it's not just hitters, you know, in this Orioles farm system. It's you, it's it's McDermott. There's a number of guys. And we've also seen that at the big league level, you know, that this is a team that last year really kind of ha- had a pitching staff, both starters and relievers, who really performed. You've been in the organization now for a little while. What is it that, you know, that that kind of as an organization, what is it that, that Baltimore's doing really well? Why, you know, what is it that's kind of helping – 
not just you, but a number of guys kind of just keep getting better and better and, and kind of paving that way to the big leagues? Yeah, I, a lot of it has to do with the staff. I mean, like Holty last year, then um, Frenchie coming over this year, the way uh, I saw him in spring training, just kind of hopping on with guys and um, getting to know everybody right away. Uh, and then a huge thing that I've seen just like even in AAA, but a lot when I was in uh, in spring training with the guys as well, just the, the way everybody communicates, starters, relievers, um, everybody's always talking, asking each other questions. Um, I mean, even being a non-roster invite like myself, plenty of guys were very approachable. Um, I was able to talk with them. And, and I think just the kind of camaraderie and brotherhood that they try to make the pitching staff, the catchers, and just the team as a whole um, has, has really been something I've seen help kind of grow everyone. Kate, I asked your friend Grayson Rodriguez yesterday about how the Tides would do against some teams in the big leagues. And he said, of course, they could win a series against some big league teams. So do you feel that way? And do your teammates feel that way? Is that a discussion? I mean, I feel that way. I think a bunch of us might feel that way. I've said it from kind of when this roster got put together in Norfolk that we're almost like not really a triple A team, but almost like a minor league or a, the major league JV team in a way. <laughs> That's a cool way to put it. I like that. I like that a lot. So with that being said, is there any frustration sometimes, especially for the hitters when they're blocked by so many talented players? So no matter what you do, you still might not have a chance to get called up for a while. Like, how do you kind of manage that, balance that? I know you're coming from the pitching side. It's a little bit different. But mm -hmm. from the position player side, when you're in a good team with a good org, you get blocked for a little bit. Yeah, I'm sure it's definitely tough. Um, I mean, I've seen plenty of guys here that could, could easily have a possibility of being on a big league team, um, whether it's sometime this year or – if they were to be on a, in a different organization. But at the same time, I, I think looking at it, we're still a really young AAA team. Um, I think a bunch of people maybe misjudge that and, and think we're a lot older. Um, but, I mean, we still have so many young guys that, um, you know, as hard and eager as they are and um, definitely should hopefully get their shot sometime soon. Uh, I mean, they, they know they're still young. Um, and they're just still putting days together. Jeff, you have one more for us? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, just walk us through kind of, you know, what you're throwing this year. I don't know if you've had any sort of alterations, um, improvements to the pitch mix. I know I saw you pitch a couple weeks ago, but it doesn't mean I necessarily picked up on everything year over year. What sort of stuff do you work on this offseason when you get ready for this year? Yeah, this offseason, I mean, basically still just putting on weight, um, trying to add weight, just – to go into a long season um and then you know we had a meeting in spring training um with the, the pitching coordinators and frenchy and, and the pitching staff just about some usage stuff um one thing I, i've been working on kind of the past couple of years has been developing my change up and getting that to be a little bit more consistent um and then something we found too is just making sure i'm using it in the right counts um, i think i've finally kind of found something that's been consistent and works and i feel like i can throw um, and I mean, I think these last two games, I've probably thrown it more than almost half a season last year. So I've definitely found something that, that works with that. And, um, then a lot of just some mental stuff, just clearing the mind, getting right back on track with some stuff. And, um, you know, it's, it's worked out, it's worked out so far. So, um, hopefully I can stay on it and continue it. Absolutely. Kate, I want to ask you, because you mentioned about trying to put on weight and all, which as someone who's middle-aged, I wish I had that problem. But uh, um, but that's been kind of something you've been working on for a while. What is that like? I mean, you know, again, you've, <laughs> you're an athlete. You've got a, you know, you've got a fast metabolism. What do you have to do to basically keep, kind of keep, not just put on good weight, but keep on that weight during the season, which has obviously been kind of a, a challenge for you at times in the past? Right. I mean, the gym's definitely been been one thing just to make sure continue getting in the weight room and make sure the weight is turning into muscle and not slowing me down and end up being um, a disadvantage. 
but I mean, it's been hard. There's definitely been, been a lot of times where you have to eat when you don't feel like eating. I know I spent a little bit of time this off season in Charlotte um, at Tread, and there were a few times there I was going a couple days a week where I'd get a medium pizza from Domino's and three little uh, chocolate cake things that they have and just trying to down those. So it's it's just trying to eat a lot and then turn that into muscle in the weight room. Hey, there's a lot of people that would love to be in your spot. Oh, you hit the weight room, play with a bunch of dudes that are basically big leaguers in AAA, and then you just crush unlimited dominoes. So life is good. Um, on, on the other side of things, we do have a fan question, and I'll kind of open it up to a global perspective here. Cliff said, how do you deal with the pressure to chase velo and spin it faster? And it's a hot topic this week in the game because – Arm care is somewhat, um, it's an epidemic, right? Right now, the, the injuries that we see in our sport. So I'm curious from your perspective, you know, when you started thinking about these things, like arm care slash, you know, chasing velo and spin and, you know, how you can try and prevent it, right? From the player side, because teams value these things. Yet we just had Dr. Meister on foul territory today telling us that, I mean, it's causing these problems. Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely a place where getting in the training room and, and doing as much as possible to feel good and, and keep your muscles muscles good and making sure you're staying healthy. I mean, that's one of, one of the biggest things is is guys that can put up innings and guys that stay healthy. Um, there, I, there's a lot that's been going on, I think, the past couple of years. And, um you know, guys are, are consistently starting to throw harder. And that's one thing that, I mean, maybe leads to it a little bit. Um, chasing it for me, as far as velocity, I, growing up, I never threw very hard. I think my pre freshman year of um, junior college in the fall, I was 80 to 84. So I just kind of had to, like I said, put on weight muscle and make sure I'm putting on muscle in the right places, trying to protect um, the areas around my arm that need it. Um, and then I think it's, it's probably a, a hot topic a little bit, but we're kind of, we've kind of gotten into an era of, um, I guess, managing, um, throwing and how much throwing guys do. I think there's, we get lost a little bit. There's definitely a limit to how much throwing can be done and not overdoing it. But I think there's a little bit of a bottom as well and making sure we're not underdoing it and having kind of a consistent ramp where, um, you know, the arm is a consistent feel. Yeah, it's a good call. I mean, that, that's been part of the discussion. Some pitchers saying that they used to take more time off in the off season and now they're not, or they're feeling pressured like they can't. So it's, it's all worth discussing. It was good to get your perspective here. Keep crushing it, Cade. Uh, appreciate the time, man. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Well, I appreciate y'all for having me on. Thank okay. you. Go Tides. All right. First off, before we dive into what Cave said, um, he is literally on the hot sheet, JJ. Literally. Well, yep. not just him, but basically him and the rest of his team. We've never had this before. We've been doing hot sheet for 25 years, I think, for us to say. And the thing that jumps out to me is, is I can't ever remember a time where we had one, two, three, four six and eight all be from the same team. But that's what we had this week because Norfolk basically went out last week and um, I, they have 29 home runs this year and no other team in the minors has more than 14 right now. They're averaging 11 runs per game. They have Jackson Holiday, they have Connor Norby, they have Kobe Mayo, they have Kyle Stowers, they have Heston Kierstead and Kay Povich, all of whom had great weeks. It's just really kind of remarkable uh what they're doing and by the way you could also tell they're home I, I recognize that i recognize where Cade was there that's the uh that that's in the tides uh offices so uh cool to see that they're home this week after a very successful week in charlotte last week yeah this team is off the charts right now and also just to clarify hot sheet as in the email that you'll get all the time with the website baseball your, 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 within your inbox and on baseballamerica.com please subscribe support ba and 
Uh, Jeff, I'd like to get to, you know, the last portion of the conversation that we had there with sure. Cade. And that's the arm injury epidemic that we're dealing with right now. And it even plays out in the rankings. If you look at recent history from BA, there are less pitchers towards the top of the list. And of course, you you and the team have to be factoring that in, right? You're trying to factor in who's going to be super successful at the next level. And we have these ticking time bombs that seem to be going off sooner and sooner. Yeah. And I think there's just, you know, an inherent risk with a pitch. Um, we've seen it in consecutive years, even with Grayson Rodriguez a few years back. Um, there was a lot of worry about him just with injuries in 2022, came up in 2023 and wasn't as effective in the first go around as I think people anticipated or had expected. Um, Andrew Painter, as far as a, a, a prep pitching prospect, I think coming out of that 22 season, we as a staff felt that he was as safe of a prep right-hander as we had seen in a really long time. Uh, he entered spring training last year with a real shot. And this has you know, been said by the team uh, to break camp as part of the rotation at 19, 20 years old and is an injury. You know, it goes on. He ends up having Tommy John surgery, and, you know, now he's on the shelf. We've seen a guy like Shane Boz who had a lot of success, uh, you know, at the major leagues in a short period of time. Experience was on a playoff rotation, experiences an injury, and, and we haven't seen him pitch in a few years. We expect him to be back in spring this year. He's still dealing with the, 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 the aftermath. We had Daniel uh, Espino, who at one point, I think in the beginning of the 22 season, we thought this was the best pitching prospect in baseball. The injuries have, have occurred, and I think it's just something that we're just way more cognizant of now that we're doing the rankings. And you know, as for how we can predict this or avoid it, there really isn't anything because a guy can seemingly have pretty good mechanics, have a track record of health, have a track record of handling innings, and there's maybe one awkward throw. Um, or he pitches when he was dealing with some fatigue in the arm or the elbow or the shoulder. And it's not just elbows either. I think we're seeing elbows right now, but we've seen a lot of major shoulder injuries as well. Um, and those are really scary. I mean, it's, it's sidetracked, you know, Brandon Woodruff's career, uh, course Espino. If we go really far back, you know, Brandon Webb never really began was one of the best pitchers in baseball with a shoulder injury. So it's just, there's so, it's not a natural thing. I think that's something that we all sort of have to come to a conclusion on. And the unfortunate part of it is uh, the biggest culprit that in terms of what the research puts out there and, and what we can comprehend is velocity. And I don't think you can tell anybody to throw slower. <laughs> like, you know, these guys are throwing harder because the fences are further in than they've ever been before. Um, the ball jumps more than it ever did before. We heard Verlander talk about that yesterday and how he, as an experienced veteran and a former Cy Young winner before that 2016 season, had to adjust how he prepared and pitched in the off and during the season are we prepared in the off season and i think that's sort of a perfect example of sort of what's going on where we can say hey velocity is going to hurt you having these particular mechanics are going to hurt you but if the results for a short period of time get that guy up to the big leagues and you know like a Str spencer strider for example get that guy into the position to be considered one of the best pitchers in baseball it's just a it's a it's really tough for them to not look at the money and look at the long term effects. And I think unfortunately that's kind of where we are. I just don't know if there's any way to fix it. The thing that jumps out to me about this is is and this is kind of one of the reasons that we are a little hesitant to put a pitcher at the top of our prospect list now is the qualities that make you the top prospect pitching prospect in baseball are the qualities that also are risk factors, right? Like Yes, you are a lower risk of having Tommy John surgery, having an elbow injury, if you throw 88. If you throw 88, you're also not one of the better pitching prospects in baseball. If you throw 92, you're not one of the better pitching prospects in baseball because velocity is a quality that makes you a better pitcher. But we also know that higher velocities put more stress on your elbow. For any pitcher, if, you throw, if that pitcher throws 90 or throws 100, 100 mile an hour out of that arm is going to put more stress on that pitcher's elbow than 90. And those are the factors that cause elbow injuries. So there's no easy way to kind of solve this. It's an incredibly complex issue. And it's one that no matter, I mean, we've seen this this week, whatever your theory is, whatever is also kind of benefit, you know, like beneficial is not the right word, but whatever fits <laughs> what you're trying to say, you can apply it to this 
because there is no easy answer and there is no easy solution that's going to solve what is really an epidemic of elbow injuries. Mm -hmm. Good call. Hey, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, yep. we'll catch you down the road on a hot sheet episode, all right? Absolutely. Thank you. And we'll swing it right to one of Jeff's teammates to hit the college ranks to finish up on hot sheet today, Peter Flaherty, joining us. And uh, there is a dominant number one team that is doing things a little bit differently in the college ranks right now. And that is Arkansas. It's a weird year. Peter, great to have you on. Thank you for the time and um, wanted to get right into what Arkansas is doing that other college programs are not, and also how surprised you are that some of the teams we're used to seeing towards the top of the rankings might be completely irrelevant by the time we get to uh, the important games. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. I'm fired up to be here. Of course, um, Peter. Yeah, go for it, man. J jump right in. Uh, first, let's start with Arkansas. Yeah, no, with Arkansas, they have been the unanimous number one team in college baseball. They've been atop our college rankings for the last five weeks. And like you said, they've done it a little differently. They're an extremely pitching dominant team. It's 2.63 ERA is tops in the country. And the next closest team is Texas A&M with a 3.27 ERA. And the obvious guy for him is left-hander Hagen Smith. He's 6-0 with a 1.76 ERA. 83 Ks and 41 innings pitched. He was really good last year and showed flashes as a sophomore, um, but he has really taken his game to the next level this year as a junior. He's got a, I mean, he's a, a workhorse on the mound at 6'3", 225. The strike throwing is improved. The stuff is legit. For me, he's got two double plus pitches in his mid to upper 90s fastball. It's been up to 100, 101. Slider's also a 70 for me. It's got a 59% miss rate. And then the split change, um, it is a fast developing viable third option. It's also above average borderline plus and the depth just up and down the pitching staff is incredibly impressive. Both Brady Tigert and Mason Molina are extremely, um, uh, extremely impressive arms in the number two and number three slot. And they've got so many weapons in the bullpen with guys like Gabe Gackle, Will McIntyre, Cody Frank, Colin Fisher. I could go on and on and virtually name the entire Arkansas pitching staff. And it's someone that everyone in the dugout is confident in and the coaching staff is confident in and sending out there for two, three, even more innings at a time. So there are really no holes to poke in this pitching staff. Peter, so while Arkansas is kind of our, our undisputed number one right now, we do have some teams that we kind of expect to kind of almost kind of live in the top 25. That are struggling a little bit right now when when you look at especially we can just even look in the sec you know like for lsu what what's kind of been been kind of the the, the problems for lsu right now yeah with lsu it's been it's been surprising everyone knew coming into this year that they they lost both a lot of talent obviously starting with dylan cruz and paul Skeens, but they also lost so much leadership from that locker room and that clubhouse Skeens, dylan cruz Cade beloso there are so many guys that were invaluable pieces that they had to replace and they're irreplaceable guys um they're 21 and 12 right now just three and nine in the sec they've lost four straight sec series and they also have a midweek loss to southern um and for me the lineup just as a whole it lacks depth and firepower tommy white sitting 321 with 11 home runs uh he's still tommy white for the most part but outside of him they're kind of looking for guys to step up hayden travinsky has been one He's sitting over 300 with a team leading 31 RBIs. He's been he's been really good for them. Jared Jones, uh, he looks like an NFL tight end. He also has 11 home runs. He's got plus raw power. Uh, freshman Stephen Malam has also stepped up. But um, they need, I mean, they just need more guys who can drive the baseball, who can hurt teams with one swing. And they just kind of lack the, I think, fear that they invoke in in teams that they did last year. Um, and then it also, I think that carries over to the pitching staff a little bit. They've got a really good one-two punch with Luke Holman and Gage Jump. And then outside of those two, uh, there's a lot of unknown. They're kind of struggling to find a viable third starter right now, given the struggles that Thatcher Hurd has endured. Um, and then the bullpen also lacks depth. But Griffin Herring has been a recent bright spot for them. He hasn't allowed an earned run in the last 12 and a third, 12 and two-thirds innings pitched. Um, and then fre freshman Kate Anderson, 
Uh, he's a really good one for them, and he's he's going to continue to be a really good one for them. But uh, they they kind of just lack depth and firepower across the board. And they take on number four Tennessee this weekend before a couple of lighter series against Missouri and Auburn. And this weekend, kind of, you can't really call it a must win at this stage, but this feels like a really important one for LSU to have if they want to build up some momentum here as we head into the to the final stretch of the regular season. I want to spin this to big picture. So, Peter, last year when LSU was flying and they've got the star power and NIL is you know a big deal in the college ranks, some fans were like, well, LSU is just going to dominate every year now because you know they're, they're going to pay the guys, they're going to get their NIL money. It's funny, it sounds like Major League Baseball. Last year, the Mets with their payroll, the Padres with their payroll, the Dodgers this season. Oh, just book it. Dodgers are going to win the World Series. Like, it's clearly not the case. So I don't know if you've observed anything in the college game, but you know, even if LSU has resources to be able to bring some top talent over there, they're not a lot to even be a playoff team. Yeah, no, the NIL landscape, it, it's such an interesting one. And I think the argument of, quote unquote, buying teams is a little bit of a tired one. I think that if you're a school and you have these resources, it certainly plays in your favor. Um, but, you know, you got to go out and win games on the field. That's what it comes down to ultimately. And LSU, even last year, um, when they built the, their kind of so-called super team, um, it wasn't all done through NIL. Like, I, I, I'm sure it was a part of it, but they didn't go out and buy Tommy White. They didn't go out and buy Paul Skeens from Air Force. Um, they, so I, I think the argument of buying teams is a little bit of a tired one, and it it makes the the recruiting landscape and the transfer season, it's just kind of like the wild, wild west uh, every summer now. It's almost like a free agency period. So it's ultra competitive between the teams at the top. Um, and it's certainly not going to be kind of the, like, I mean, we see it this year with the struggles that LSU is going through. It's not going to be the same, like two to three teams that are winning the national title every year. The, the thing that, that I kind of would just kind of follow up with that Peter is, is you said like with this LSU team, okay, they got Tennessee this weekend. The pieces are still here, right? Like the, this is the team that if they can get into the field of 64, has the chance to really do some damage, especially like you said, with the kind of the front of that rotation. How likely is that though at this point? With you know, it, it, they they really kind of do need. You said it's not do or die this weekend, but a bad series this weekend kind of puts them. If you don't make the the SEC tournament, then you are really going to be facing kind of an almost impossible path. Oh yeah, if you don't make the SEC tournament, that's a that's a doomsday scenario. They're almost inevitably not going to make the tournament at that point, but. This weekend feels like a big one because even if they, you know, if they lose this series at Tennessee, they're looking at at best four and eleven in the SEC with five series left. And like I said, they go into a little bit of a lighter stretch with Missouri and Auburn um, coming up. But still, there are no easy series in the SEC. So if they can go to Lindsey Nelson Stadium and kind of pull a rabbit out of their hat, that's going to play. It's, it's going to be so huge for them, both from a resume standpoint. And then also a momentum building and confidence standpoint going forward, because it could kind of be a little bit of a turning point weekend, a little bit like what I thought last weekend was for Wake Forest. They go on the road and notch a top 20 sweep of Virginia Tech. If they can go to Tennessee and leave Knoxville with a top five series win, I think they could really get rolling because as you mentioned, they do have the personnel. It's not as talented and it's not as deep of a group as last year's national championship team. It was going to be, impossible to replicate that kind of depth and talent but they do have pieces and no one is going to be sitting there on selection monday being happy that they got lsu in their region or be happy that they're going to baton rouge it is a team that no one is going to want to play peter good stuff thanks for chiming in appreciate you absolutely thanks for having me on thank you and make sure you follow all of peter's work in the college ranks and JJ, another packed show, including our first guest, Cade Povich. I love it. And just want to remind everyone also about the Prospect Wire. Want to shout that out again? We, we've got a ton of stuff at BaseballAmerica.com. Also, if you want to check it out, we just rolled out 70 players who stood out on the backfields in spring training. So, I mean, Josh Norris for us talked to more scouts than I even probably uh, want to even imagine to get this. All that's the baseballamerica.com. And again, by the way, an updated top 25 for college ranks too. 
Subscribe to Baseball America, also to the podcast version of this show. And if you're listening to this show on the BA podcast feed, why don't you check out the YouTube channel? We do a lot here uh, in terms of video, graphics, the whole deal. You'll like it. So check out the Baseball America YouTube channel. And we'll see you every single Tuesday for Hot Cheat.